Hey guys, what is going on? I am Alexander Williamson here with The Secret History Living in Your Aquariums. So today we're going to be talking about tannins. And when a leaf falls, it loses its green chlorophyll, it loses its water and some of its volatile uh, organic compounds. It dries out, it wilts, and you get left with kind of a matrix as it gets drier and drier of veins and this debris. Well, what's in these leaves? You know, we know that adding catapa almond leaves into your aquarium is beneficial for things like bettas, gouramis, shrimp, snails, but why? And how did they come to be? What is their purpose in plants? And the fact that they have so many uses and that so many benefits are gained by this, even if you're not doing black water aquariums or a biotope aquarium where it's super loaded with tannins and it looks like tea, we're going to get into telling the story that you've never heard anywhere else on any aquarium channel, let alone any other probably history or science channel, where we're going to talk about the different types of tannins, why they evolved as these pesticides and insecticides to keep predators from eating the plants until they're ready to spread their seed, and then how seed pods, bark, twigs, uh, and leaves, all of a sudden, those same tannins totally change their uh, arrangement and their bonds, and they become attractive to fish, to mammals, to insects, when the plant is ready to spread its seeds. And this has led to countless items that humans have interacted with that we love, be it chocolate, be it coffee, wine, uh, grapes, uh, strawberries, bananas, vinegars, you name it, they've got tannins in it. And it's also the acidic properties that you may have heard about where you can lower the pH of your aquarium with tannic acid, and it's usually left at that, tannic acid. Well, today we're going to get into the types of tannins and the subcategories of acidic compounds that are in tannic acid. The human history of that and how we learned about it and just how little we know about the over 8,000 that we've recognized, but the fact that there are probably three to four times as many uh, of these incredible compounds we call tannins, these uh, organic uh, phenols uh, that are in a plant once the green drains away and you're left with more and more of the skeleton and the water's all gone, and you've got your dried out Indian almond leaves or your choya wood or your Mopani driftwood or whatever it is you're going to use in your aquarium. Uh, we're going to talk about just what it is that it can do for your aquarium, both on the microscopic, the biological, fungal, archaea, and uh, bacterial levels, but also on the nutritional levels. They're packed with nutrients and trace elements that you can't find anywhere else in nature oftentimes in these uh, ecosystems. So they play an incredibly important role. Even in tanks like these ones behind me that are considered high tech, I still include leaves and tannins. And we're gonna talk about why that is. And of course, we're also gonna talk about the human history and discovery of tannins and just how new that is, yet how old it is. Because some of the oldest writing in human history the Old Testament, the Dead Sea Scrolls, some of the Egyptian texts on papyrus, and a lot of the early Greek, Roman, and Carthaginian texts that are on vellum and sheepskin, they were written with an ink made out of 90% tannins. And so we're going to get into all these stories, these facets, and answer those questions you didn't even know you had. So again, it's gonna be a mostly audio-based episode and uh, feel free to put some headphones on, do your water changes, drive to work, whatever it may be. But this is going to be the most comprehensive video on tannins that you're going to find uh, on the internet, I guarantee it. So if you like this content, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe for more. Check out my other videos on specific leaves, specific tannins. We don't have time to get into the 8,000 of them, but we will get a really concrete overview of what's going on, how they evolved, and the role they play in the ecology of 
are planted aquariums or even unplanted aquariums and how they can be used to incredible effect uh, that we're still uncovering the benefits of uh, every day. So get ready, get yourself a drink or a snack and let's jump in talking about everything you didn't even know you needed to know about tannins. All right, everybody. So today we are taking a very deep dive into the incredible world of tannins. Now, you know those organic chemicals that are found in leaves and wood that turn your aquarium water into a range of tea colors, from mahogany to yellow or brown. Some people love them, some people hate them, but they have an incredible purpose beyond just changing the color. And depending on whether you're keeping shrimp or fish, uh, especially tropical fish that live in flooded forests, like so many of the tetras, the bettas, rasboras, uh, danios, things like that do, uh, many cichlids as well, uh, they have an incredible role to play and they have evolved side by side with us as well as all of those creatures and that's what we're going to get into. So well beyond what you may or may not know about the 8,000 unique chemicals we've identified that we call tannins, today in this video we're going to discuss the role they first played in plants. So they have evolved uh, to play the role in ecosystems and aquariums very differently than the way they evolved, period, which in our aquariums we all know that they can change the pH by lowering it or rather raising the acidity, especially if your tank is not buffered and the water has a low TDS. They can also help sequester compounds that are floating in the water that are dissolved and lower the TDS. They can help boost beneficial bacterial and aufuchs, which are a whole thing we'll talk about soon, but they're biofilm layers. They can help your fish and the uh, biofilm or the slime coat that gives them their uh, immune response essentially on the exterior and can help prevent disease, as well as they are a building block and the first trophic level on a food web or pyramid of aquatic uh, ecosystems where all your little microscopic seed shrimp, crustaceans, daphnia, brine shrimp, whatever it may be, uh, they utilize bacteria, fungi, archaea that eat the compounds in tannins that survive off them and then sequester those chemicals and build them up into a dense uh, concentration which then fish eat and they get a concentration. So if some of these tannins are rich in vitamin C for instance, there's a little bit in all of the, the broken up leaf debris at the bottom of your aquarium, fungi and bacteria form a colony over it, then other tiny little creatures we can't even see start eating that they keep that in their system, then medium-sized creatures start eating that, then small fish, fry, shrimp, they start eating that as well, and it starts to sequester more and more of these nutrients that oftentimes are lacking in the aquarium, and a lot of these are things like omega-3s, omega-6s, when they're eating those creatures, uh, those fatty acids, and in combination with things like athataskin, anthocyanins, and cytokine, things like that, they are all part of what plays a role in keeping your fish bright and beautiful, your shrimp allowing them to molt easily and uh, to, to survive and thrive. So we do need to go back a little bit to talk about uh, how we first came to interact with tannins and what it is they do in their ecosystem. So tannins are essentially a defense mechanism for plants. That's what they do at first. And they have this uh, really fascinating uh, history um, and uh, duality to them. So tannins are first, they're going to be in the early cycles of the plant, they're going to be what's bitter and what is astringent and kind of uh, puts a taste in your mouth almost like a waxy coating or a, a, just a, a nasty kind of sour, bitter, 
and literally acidic, so changing the pH, um, compound and, and suite of chemicals. Most leaves have uh, a whole host of dozens, if not hundreds, of tannic uh, uh, compounds. And within that, there's also a whole array of acids, which we'll get into. But in the early part of the plant's life, it wants to grow up big and strong and not get eaten by mammals, insects, and things like that. And these tannins actually act as a, a pest deterrent, and the plants grow. And then suddenly, tannins have evolved this magical ability to bond and to their, their large... Uh, they're large molecules generally, and they can all of a sudden snap together like Lego bricks, and they can connect to big chunks of other things uh, in the environment from proteins, lipids, and enzymes and things. They all can interact in really fascinating ways that are not understood fully yet. But what we are realizing is that they have properties like being antioxidants, like stopping free radicals and uh, all sorts of things that we can't say for sure they will do in humans, but we know that the pharmaceutical industries are spending literally billions of dollars researching tannins. And in our aquarium, we know for a fact that it can double the rate of uh, shrimp molting and growing and breeding. Uh, as well as somewhere between 30 and 40 percent increases in how many of their babies survive and how many are uh, produced in a given year. Beyond that, we know that they have massive impacts on the vitality of fish, the length of, of which fish can live, and you don't need to be seeing them at levels of in, where your whole aquarium is, is uh, brown or yellow or red. Uh, for them to be playing a role. They play a very important role even at low levels and it's important to talk about that. Just like the the little films and slight slimy feel you'll feel on the inside of your aquarium, that is algae, that is fungi, that is bacteria, archaea, and all sorts of microscopic life forms that work together in a layer we call aufuchs and uh, that's a German word, and I have a whole video on that, but that becomes a matrix, a home, for all these other tiny little creatures. And as I mentioned in the beginning, those then sequester those unique chemicals, those compounds, and even elements that may not be available anywhere else in the ecosystem, definitely aren't specialized in, in a lot of the foods, even when they're for tropical fish or for color enhancing. There's a whole suite of chemicals we don't quite understand, but we know that it is noticeably uh, increasing how bright these fish are coloring up. It is increasing how quickly they heal from injuries. It is basically helping their gut biology internally as well as that slime coat which is almost like you get a runny nose and you have mucus well they have something like that all over their body uh don't think about it too much but all over their body that slime coat or that biofilm it needs a, a boost it needs basically probiotics just like your gut does and tannins are there to play a major role in that so we're gonna jump in and get to that but one of the really amazing things that tannins also uh, have to tell us about our journey evolving and growing as a society and as a human race is what we've used them for so if you go back all the way the word tannin uh, comes from the the proto uh, Anglo-Saxon or English, early English, uh, mixed with Germanic and Viking uh, Norse uh, languages, uh, and it means to uh, tan a hide. So tanning a hide was when you'd scrape off all the stuff that's going to decay, that smell bad, the the meat basically, and you're left with the tough leathery uh, hide and then you cure it in tannins. And oftentimes that meant soaking it in uh, leaves. And like I said earlier, they would wait for all the uh, green chlorophyll and the stuff that's gonna rot and, and cause issues uh, being volatile in itself, cause mold and things like that. They wait for that to go away and they are left with the scaffold within the plants 
which is completely filled with things like carbon and uh, nitrogen, hydrogen, uh, oxygen, all those things uh, that you know are the building blocks of life. But beyond that, 50% of the dry weight is going to be the tannins. And every uh, plant is going to have a different profile, whether it's uh, the cap of a coconut uh, and the, the crazy amount of tannins that are in these woodier parts of the plants, or whether it's leaves. Things like alder cones, for instance, may have far more tannins per gram, per their weight. A little alder cone this big may have as much as an entire uh, palm frond. So the concentration varies a lot, and humans over time figured this out, and they started soaking their hides in this. And the acidity would cause bacteria not to be able to grow, because it is not a hospitable environment when you have dropped the pH so much. So one really important thing that tannins would do is drop the pH, and they can do that in our aquarium too. You can also add things like uh, you know, your KH and your GH, your TDS. You can play with those things, and you can modulate how much you want the tannins to actually drop down your pH. And it's going to vary with uh, if you've made an extract by boiling things down, uh, then you're going to have different amounts of tannins you're adding. And even one tree, like an oak tree, uh, which is where the Western world most likely first encountered uh, using tannins in a big way. Uh, in these oak trees, uh, the leaves, you know, from tree to tree vary in potency based on how they were grown, the soil they were grown in, the light they got, the, the lifespan of the tree. Now, one really interesting thing in the history of humans and tannins is that uh, the first major use other than tanning hides and uh, also helping to ferment beverages and things, which we don't have a record of. This was going on at least 8,000 years ago. It's very old prehistory, and it helped humans colonize, you know, Siberia, uh, North America, crossing the land bridge most likely. It helped us make things like uh, boats out of seal skin. Uh, tannins uh, were a way to soak hides and uh, various animal parts and render them uh, preserved, essentially. It was one of the first methods of preserving things. And in the process of doing that, we also realized that they help ferment things. And so a lot of vinegars and things like wine are very dependent on the tannins for their taste, but also for when people talk about the acidity of wine and things like that. All that is due to the skin of the grape and how much of which kind of tannins they have. And they've been selectively bred, whether we knew what tannins were or not, for those traits. And uh, usually the darker it is uh, in color, be it red or brown or blue, if it's a dark, dark color, usually there's going to be more tannins there as a general rule. Uh, and same with the density of the wood. Now, the oak tree, let's get back to that for a minute, and I want to tell you a fascinating story before we get back to aquariums about how human history all ties into this. Because, you know, when we talk about aquariums, it's not just the history of fish, plants, ecology, it's the history of humanity as well, and culture. And on our way to where we are today with spaceships and, uh, you know, mass spectrometry and uh, all sorts of uh, what uh, <laughs> nuclear science and things like that. Uh, we had to progress. We had to share information. And it was on those same hides that we had tanned and we had worked in different processes like vellum and like sheep's hides and goat hides where ancient cultures three, 4,000 years ago would use tannins to preserve those hides so that they wouldn't rot. And on the smooth side, the leather side uh, of that hide, whether they decide to get rid of the fur or the hair or not, that was preserved and written on for important documents. And documents also were written on papyrus in the Near East, in the Middle East. Uh, and that itself is a plant full of tannins and fiber that was either mashed down or even just written on sometimes in uh, in its organic state on these little slips 
of, uh, of, of plant matter. But they realized that that would deteriorate. And so soon they started looking for a way to preserve the writing. Now, cooking clay tablets was one way, but carrying a bunch of clay tablets gets heavy. So these thin vellum papers or, or basically manuscripts that were written on, and we're talking about Old Testament days, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, for instance, had an ink that was created by the gall of a oak tree. So oak trees all over Europe, Northern Africa, the Middle East, uh, they had uh, these knots on them, these nodules that almost looked like cancer. And what they are is they're from a wasp, specific wasp. There's around two or three dozen that sting the tree and then they put their young in there and they hatch out. But while they do that, it sends a crazy response in the cells of the tree to build this dense mass. And when they would cut those off, sometimes called oak apples, uh, they could cut them open and almost like a truffle, there'd be this dark black uh, colored uh, substance in there and that is gall. Now, if you've read about it, G-A-L, it's been used throughout history for all sorts of things, from medicine to, uh, to fixing uh, paints to finishing furniture. It has a wild history, but it is a pure uh, concoction, basically. It's like 90% tannins. And so that someone figured out that when you use spring water that has sulfur in it and a little bit of iron, which happened to be what was in the spring water when I was down in Florida on the farms, those were the iron and the sulfur were the two biggest uh, issues they had that they needed to sometimes get out of there to put into their uh, fish uh, breeding operations. But when they, if you were not to do that, if you were just to use it as it comes out of the ground, as it does in the Middle East and all throughout Europe, Iceland, uh, Yellowstone, all over the place, this happens around the world. When they mix that gall, that, that crushed dark inside of that oak apple or oak gall, they created this blue, uh, black ink and then they'd mix in iron filings or sometimes carbon with it from fire um, from charcoal and that would actually get darker with time and these writings lasted thousands of years to the point where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in a cave in the 1940s and they were over 2,500 years old uh, biblical texts, things like the Iliad and the Odyssey, things like Pliny the Elder and uh, some of the earliest Greek writings were all done with this. Now later on, by around uh, the Roman era, they figure out to uh, mix gum Arabic with it, which is kind of like a latexy or sappy um, additive. And they were able then to bond the ink even better and to prevent it from rusting uh, the, the pH in that gall and tannin was strong enough that it would actually uh, corrode the metal tips, uh, the copper or brass tips that they would use um, on, on some of the writing implements and later on quills in medieval times. And so that, that uh, viscousness that came from the uh, gum Arabic was able to help avoid that, but also it really made it fuse with the paper as a polymer. And that is when humans realize that tannins also fuse with other compounds and things like being oxygenated or exposed to UV light can have profound impacts. They can make something that's once bitter into something that's smoky or nutty. Uh, and we still don't really understand this. There are literally thousands of papers on this. And right now, uh, the pharmaceutical industries around the world are trying to research this and understand it, as well as you know the aquarium industry. But we still just don't know what all these chemicals do and what they do in different combinations. So as I was saying before this tangent, talking about human history and the interesting uses of tannins, and that's just scratching the surface uh, in the interest of time, these same tannins that are in uh, the plants, they, like I said, they, they bond and they change, and then 
they become appealing to things like mammals and birds. And all of a sudden, when they were avoiding them because of the bitterness and they didn't want to eat the plants, suddenly now they want to eat them. And those beans and seeds that are within the plants are then digested. And oftentimes they've evolved to survive that and sometimes even need it to then uh, sprout forth and, and grow elsewhere. So sometimes they need the bird to digest it and drop it 200 miles away uh, where the species can spread. So they play this very uh, dualistic role uh, evolutionarily of love them or hate them, you know. Uh, it depends on when you catch them and what they've bonded with. But in the process, they also bond with metals. Unlike most orga organic compounds, they bond extremely well with metals and they are able to sequester a lot of different metals, whether that's the iron, like uh, I was talking about in the ink, or whether that is trace elements like zinc, cadmium, um, arsenic, whatever it may be, these trace elements are also crucial for other plants to grow because they're going to need to metabolize tannins also. And just like that as well, everything from fungi to bacteria, to beneficial bacteria that are in our tanks that help keep uh, things balanced, they can utilize those micronutrients that are then diffused out into the water. And that's another key thing about tannins is they are all water soluble. And that is uh, a rarity of, of chemicals that are able to bond with so many other chemicals. Uh, in the wild, a lot of times if something bonds easily, it bonds quickly to something within the plant or within the organism or as soon as that chemical is exposed or created and that's the end of it. Whereas these kind of lay in wait and will bond uh, in the environment and even after the, the leaf is dead and those chemicals are in there and seeped out. And that means they can do things like sequester chemicals also so they can take all the uh, bad things uh, that are in the water, such as uh, heavy metals or something like that, and they can bond to it, go to the bottom, and there's going to be a layer of it that over time gets buried. And basically, until new plants grow or whatnot and reconstruct those elemental things, uh, they basically can concentrate them. Now, fungi also do this same thing. And even though you don't think of mushrooms growing in your aquarium, your, your aquarium is absolutely full of uh, fungus. And uh, if you want to think of it as mold or, or fungi, whatever it may be, mildew, uh, those are all fungi. And when you feel that slick, slimmer, slimy uh, feeling on your aquarium, that's that biofilm that we've been talking about. And that, those biofilms are really not possible without phenols, which all tannins are phenols, but they're not possible without those and the basic building blocks that are in organic compounds such as plants, such as fish and the waste they produce. And I find that absolutely fascinating. So next, let's talk a little bit about in the aquarium, what role do these tannins play and, and what are the different tannins? So when we talk about the different types of tannins, let's talk first about the role they have to play in your aquarium. And there are several good things they do. Really the only bad things they, that you would say they do is they make the aquarium look kind of cloudy or dim and discolored in that tea tone. Um, that's really the main thing as well as they can drop the acidity uh, or drop the pH, which is raising the acidity. Um, now, most tropical fish actually tend to come from uh, slightly acidic waters, if not very acidic waters. So that's a pretty good thing in a lot of cases. You don't want to drop it too much, but a little bit is great. So the first thing that's great is the coloration. They create that tea color, sometimes deep mahogany reds, sometimes hues of browns and yellows and ochre. And they have a secondary impact of reducing algae because they don't allow as much light to get through to the algae. Whereas plants that are immersed or at the top, they actually have the chlorophyll in dense enough layers. Plus, underneath the chlorophyll, 
they have the other color uh, wavelengths uh, of chlorophyllic uh, cells that we see in autumn. So when the green is gone, you see the reds and the oranges uh, that are in weight, that are basically a sunscreen version of the chlorophyll or a filter over the chlorophyll. And because of that, they can work with that light coming through uh, and only brown or red algae can really deal with that same light wavelength. So just having them in your aquarium is going to reduce your chances of having algae. Now, beyond that, they also seem to, in studies, uh, inhibit the growth of certain algae as well. They seem to, uh, in some uh, concentrations, stop algae in low doses. Whereas in high doses, they can actually increase algae. So there are these really duplicitous things, uh, tannins, and it's hard to just say tannins because we'll get into the, the main types, but they are a wide array of chemicals, uh, even within the main types that exist. So beyond tannins containing acids that reduce the pH in your aquarium, uh, reducing the pH or r rising the, uh, raising the acidity in your water. Many tropical fish and shrimp live in flooded forests and lakes and streams, and they accumulate large amounts of leaves and botanical debris. So they have co-evolved reasons to utilize the tannins in the water. Things like gouramis and bettas, angelfish, tetras, rasboras, you name it, uh, corridoras. And they found in studies, even though they still don't know exactly why, that oftentimes tannins can increase the survival rate of fry and they greatly reduce uh, the occurrence of disease in, in these same animals. So primarily they help encourage a healthy biofilm as we talked about. They make that slime coat um, viscous, just like the mouthy feel in wine that kind of coats your mouth. They help with oils and other uh, lipids that are found in plants as well as the food that they're going to eat, little insects, crustaceans, whatever it may be. That creates a slime coat that is more uh, robust and when they need to repel something, they're then able to secrete this stickier mass that then can slough off and basically get rid of those pathogens. Beyond that, it also gets passed on to the next generation of fish oftentimes. Uh, and it's very complex, the chemistry that's going on because it's live um, cultures, just like in our gut biome and how that's hard to study. But it's fascinating nonetheless to know that the outcome, which in my opinion is the most important part of just putting a catapa leaf, for instance, in with your betta is going to be that you have a healthier fish. Now, you could also put an oak leaf or a maple leaf in there. And the effects will vary depending, like I said, on the individual uh, tree, leaf, where it's from, and the species of it, which will dictate which tannins have evolved to be present. Now, beyond that, microorganisms in all those little slimy layers and things, uh, they get part of their elasticity and become polymerized because of bonding with tannins, which allows them to be stretchy, allows them to be resilient, and it allows them to kind of grow. And they may be infused with bacteria, algae, nitrifying bacteria, uh, the stuff that gets rid of ammonia and nitrite and nitrates and converts it into other useful things that the plants can then metabolize and use. Well, it also sequesters all those things that the plant in its life used uh, metabolically, used the tannins, not just to keep away predators, but also to keep trace elements. Things like gold that you wouldn't even think needs to be in your body. Everybody needs a little bit of gold. You know, it's there for the functionality of certain very niche processes in certain specialized cells. And there are so many elements, obviously, if you've seen the periodic table of elements and uh, ions of those and different uh, compounds, uh, you get more and more complex as you add elements together into molecules and compounds. But a lot of those are only sequestered in these ecosystems. The only place they're being found is in 
the tannins of those plants, or at least bonded to them, which is really interesting. Now, also these tannins, while they're helping all this good bacteria in these slime coat layers, uh, paradoxically, a lot of times they're noted for killing bacteria. And it's really a head scratcher how they can help the good bacteria that we want in the ecosystem and kill the stuff we don't want, like staph or strep or things like that. Um, even viral things it can have an impact on uh, in certain studies. Uh, and that's literally uh, exposure to it. Not, I'm not saying that if you have uh, an illness, eating tannins is going to target it or anything. This is on a, a cell to compound head to head basis. And it could just be that altering that pH does it. But over time, all the processes we want in our aquarium have evolved with plants decaying, with them turning into mulm, going down to the bottom with those elements uh, being brought in that way and through sediment and through rainfall and things like that. And those tannins are then reincorporated into the plant and uh, a lot of times in completely unique ways. So having a diversity of these uh, can be really helpful in that it doesn't seem to impact any of the nitrosoma or nitrobacillus that we use for um, filtering uh, our tanks biologically and that we use for having a balanced cycled tank that can quickly grow and, and take on uh, an influx of ammonia or nitrites or nitrates. Uh, but it does seem to stop some of the growth of uh, sort of predatory um, colonies of even fungus, mildew, things like that. And it's not that it it knows what's good or bad, it's that all these things have evolved together. So these plants, these fish, these biofilms, they've learned to utilize one another. And if they're not serving a role, they either get destroyed or they get um, avoided or they they get selected for to not be there. And so it's almost like puzzle pieces that work perfectly for our aquariums. And that's what makes tannins fascinating. Uh, so they also have anti-mutagenic properties, meaning that when DNA uh, in cells is replicating, the presence of tannins in solution and surrounding cells uh, has been shown to reduce the chance of errors. So uh, the fact that we're already inbreeding things like guppies or uh, cichlids and things for certain features and colors, tannins actually have been shown in studies to reduce the errors. And oftentimes when things are inbred, there's gonna be a lot of errors that stay there. And sometimes they even compound and recopy and you get these redundant segments that are not helpful and that are actually bad, like uh, harmful to the eyesight or don't allow the spine to form, things like that. And it has been shown that the tannins actually uh, reduce that. Now, beyond that, they also reduce free radicals and uh, the, the bonding of other things like arsenic and heavy metals, mercury, um, lead, cadmium, things like that. They actually uh, basically bond with that first before the cells and the creatures can. Now, there's a double-edged sword to that in that if you've got this layer of tannins that has been exposed to those things, which hopefully in your aquarium it hasn't, it can like comprise, uh, uh, compress it and concentrate it into one layer, just like mushrooms do. They may suck up all the uh, mercury and other problematic uh, things in the soil, but then when that fungal bloom is concentrated as tissue and dies, you've got a lump of uh, decaying volatile organics and you've got uh, mercury sitting in basically a sequestered pile. And so that is good if we know about it and we can remove it, but in your aquarium, it shouldn't be an issue. You shouldn't be building up those things. And this is a long-term thing that I just wanted to mention about the ecology of uh, all of this. So the fact that it, it reduces uh, free radicals and antioxidants, uh, that it's rich in antioxidants, also hints that 
it helps in preventing the damage of aging with cells uh, being exposed to, to oxygen and free radicals, as well as those copying errors. So it is kind of this miracle compound. But we got to get into what are tannins. You keep saying tannins, and then you said it's more complex than that. There's 8,000 of them. So what makes it a, a, a tannin? And uh, that is what we're going to talk about right now. And uh, it's a group of chemicals uh, that are phenols, and we call them tannins. They can be the pesticide to protect plants while they grow, yet a small change in the chemistry within the plants, and suddenly they cause a desirable flavor or an aromatic flavor, and they help the spread of the seeds. Now, they've evolved over millions of years, and it's worth noting, too, that those uh, spices and flavors have literally led to the death of millions of humans throughout history. The movement of slaves, uh, of um, explorers, and even expansion into new continents and new parts of the world, uh, as well as the fact that those hides allowed us to expand into colder regions as having that as clothing. Uh, so tannins, in a real way, have pushed both humanity and they push these ecosystems to do more with less in a way. Uh, they're a really fascinating thing. So, so uh, back to what I was saying, which is what are tannins? Well, specifically they're defined as a group of compounds found in many plants, almost all plants, and they play several key roles in the biology of plants. Now, number one is to bind with harmful compounds and render them less hazardous. Number two is to polymerize and become basically a flexible uh, compound, just like uh, the ability for a leaf to spring back uh, to where it was. And this helps uh, plants turn uh, towards the light as cells grow and uh, helps them with their photosynthesis uh, by allowing them to be springy. This provides uh, things like uh, the, the ability for plants to help uh, start creating things in, in their sap and in, in their um, leaf tissues such as uh, latex and things. Even though those are separate compounds in another group, uh, they're all aided in the growth uh, and in the lifespan of the plant by tannins. And as we mentioned before, tannins are there to also protect plants uh, and to change both the taste and the acidity of uh, bark, leaves, uh, seed pods, and so forth, uh, to turn away uh, animals when they don't want them and also to attract them when they do want them. So chemically speaking, tannins are put into three categories. We don't need to worry about this in the aquarium hobby too much unless you're really doing some deep level research and you've got access to figuring out what tannins are in which leaf and rich profiles of that. And that information really just hasn't been researched a whole lot other than in the food industry and a little bit in the uh, pharmaceutical industry. And I say a little bit not in uh, the fact that they've spent billions, but they've only researched very key things like anti-aging, anti-cancer uh, uh, effects, things like that. And I must say that there are a lot of claims online that the antioxidants, the anti-free uh, radical uh, Im effects that this have uh, in tannins uh, are some wonder or miracle cure for humans. And so far, the evidence has not bared that out, and the FDA has put out a warning like not to believe supplement sellers and uh, nutritional gurus online and stuff that are saying this is some magical cure for everything. We just don't quite understand it all the way yet, even though we've evolved hand in hand with it. Uh, but basically, uh, when you're looking at them, uh, and pardon my uh, terrible pronunciation of these biochemical compounds, but you've got three tannin groups, and that's gallotanninins, and that's e ELA get tannins, and uh, as well as a third group called complex tannins. Now, within complex tannins, there's a whole other uh, categorization, and that is uh, the ones that are sugar derivatives and mainly glucose and uh, gallic acid and egallic acid, 
and egallic uh, derivatives, just like uh, we talked about gall, those uh, swollen uh, nodes on oak trees, that's where that word is coming from, that gall or egallic acid. Uh, and it wasn't known what aspect of the tannins was doing this or causing this uh, for a long time. It wasn't until uh, really the 1800s that, that we figured this out. So it's kind of interesting how closely we worked with them yet how little we know about them and that's still the case. So all three of these uh, tannins are going to be water soluble and they're going to be in the chemical class of what we call phenols. Uh, and they also are all going to be able to bond readily with other compounds and other elements, which is kind of an interesting trait. Uh, now, this is still a really broad definition, uh, and that kind of doesn't help limit it. But uh, egallic acid and gallic acid, uh, as well as pyrogallic acid, are the main components of what makes um, tannins or tannic acid it's made up of those uh, constituent uh, acids, the egallic, the gallic, and the pyrogallic acid. And the main components of most tannin compounds were not isolated until uh, the chemist Henri Brancano uh, actually figured this out in 1831. So they couldn't even figure out what tannic acid really was until 1831. And then later it was uh, Julius Lowe who figured out uh, how to synthesize these uh, and make them in the lab rather than just extracting them from plants, how to basically rebuild them, reverse engineer them. Uh, and he basically synthesized egallic acid by heating uh, galls from oak trees and uh, then he got gallic acid and, and he mixed that with arsenic acid and silver oxide, which then uh, he was able to uh, create the egallic acid uh, out of that when it was distilled down. Later on, Maximilian uh, Nierenstein, uh, he studied the, the natural phenols and tannins found in different plant species. And this goes on up into the 1940s. He's studying these 1920s, 30s, and 40s. And this is when he realizes that uh, it is these tannins, not the acidic part of the tannin, the acidity of it, but rather these nuanced tannins and phenols within the tannin that give different plants their uh, flavor palettes and things. So things like coffee, grapes, uh, cacao, all of that he is able to um, separate out and then start categorizing. But it's not until the late 1940s that we're able to do that. And today, we still have a hard time doing that. Today, though, the tannin industry is booming in that we still use it in certain parts of the world to process hides, to cure many different organic things, to uh, start as a catalyst for collecting things like iron or sulfur out of solution. We also use them uh, in you know, health supplements and folk remedies for many years. And uh, they're also being researched heavily at universities and labs by pharmaceutical companies, but they're also being used as pigments. Just like they can dye your aquarium water, they can dye things like yarn. And that has been done for literally probably 10,000 years. There's evidence of that. Uh, it's also uh, seen as a catalyst for advanced nano nanoparticle engineering. So as we were talking about the unique abilities of this, we're also finding that it arranges things into really bizarre structures, into like twisting helixes and pyramids and things like that. When you extract the one specific tannin and you mix it with one other element or compound uh, or chemical, it can do these really interesting things, and it can also form these long chain polymers, which we can use as uh, sealants or plastics, things like that. Um, and it's kind of uh, a way to possibly replace a lot of our synthetic chemicals and hydrocarbon based chemicals with a uh, less harmful chemical that will naturally decompose. So that's kind of the overview of where we are today. 
uh, but they are always finding new uses for things. I mean, from uh, encouraging collagen in your skin and keeping things young and reducing uh, free radicals, antioxidants, and those copying errors, they're being used in the cosmetic industry. Uh, and then they're also, like I said, in the unregulated, uh, unregulated nutritional supplement industry, they're all over the place. But there's a little bit of truth, a little bit of witchcraft snake oil to it in there. And we need to wait for the peer reviewed science for those big companies spending billions, but you better believe it, that they're gonna say something and, and uh, try to patent it once they figured that out. But the takeaway from this uh, for you guys, for your aquariums, I hope, is that uh, by looking at the systems that unfold in the wild, the more we can get information about what our fish live like in the wild, how they evolved hand in hand with plants, animals, uh, tannins, uh, whatever it may be, uh, biofilms, bacteria, uh, all of that will help us understand their optimal living conditions and hopefully help us reintroduce bits and pieces of that to a very synthetic style of living where they're in this small box that's not this massive ecosystem that's able to get, you know, um, elements flooding in when, when there's dust storms and washing down from creeks and water turning over in streams all day long. We have to use biomimicry to do that. But through careful observation, as well as continued research, we should be able to figure that out. We should be able to learn, and we are now, knowing things like the fact that alder cones are heavy in the type of... Uh, tannin and the, the acids, the uh, pyrogallic acids that are antifungal and antibacterial. So if you're maybe raising um, baby fish, maybe it's those that you'd want to put in the water. You need to watch the pH and make sure it's within their limits. But maybe it is uh, learning that we can use those instead of methylene blue to kill bacterial uh, growths and fungal growths on the eggs. Uh, and have it much less harmful and have it be something you can throw in your garden rather than like technically you're supposed to get rid of some of those things, you know, uh, at toxic waste dumps and things like that. I'm being a little melodramatic, but my point is uh, we can learn from the, these natural ecosystems, these natural processes and figure out how to incorporate them into our aquariums or I mean also how to brew a darn good cup of coffee or make a really tasty chocolate bar. Wherever your interest lies in this, I hope that you enjoyed this. These deep dives take a lot of research. I could have gone down a whole bunch of other rabbit holes and gotten into a lot of chemistry jargon that I would have totally butchered the pronunciation of, but I hope you guys like this one, and I hope it helps, gives you an understanding of your aquarium or this slice of the hobby, and why, even if you don't have a black water tank, why it's good to add these botanicals, and what it is that you might be looking for down the road as we learn what's in there, as we get a bag of these leaves and read that there's this or that acid, this or that um, amount of vitamin C, vitamin B12, whatever it may be, uh, now hopefully you'll understand the role that this plays in the, na the natural world and in the ecology of our tanks, and we can figure out how to incorporate it here into our glass boxes. So thank you so much for watching. If you made it to the end, you are a true nerd, a true hero uh, of the channel, and you're doing the biggest thing that supports the channel. Um, I mean, sharing helps, being a member uh, for a buck 99, you are, you're gonna get the behind the scenes stuff, you're gonna get my sources, uh, even the outline or scripts to episodes like this, as well as another uh, 16 to 20 episodes a month. Uh, that dollar ninety nine goes a long way to securing the fact that I can work forty, fifty, sixty, eighty hours a week on researching and making videos like this that may not always be the most click worthy or highest production value, but rest assured that I've been researching this for like a month and finally wanted to put it together for you guys to do an overview before we jump back into my former series that I left off with Jackfruit on where we talk about the specific traits of 
each and every uh, botanical that are commonly available in the hobby right now. Uh, so thank you so much. I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Also, if you really like this video, I think there's the option to like give a super thanks, and that really does help me uh, spend more time researching because uh, I still got to pay all the bills even if I'm reading a book all day or uh, tracking down biologists and calling uh, you know research and development chemists at uh, unnamed uh, aquarium uh, chemical companies and things like that. Uh, so big shout out and a big thanks to those folks. You guys know who you are, who I've been pestering the last month about all this. But again, have a great day. I'll talk to you guys next time. You guys are champs for making it through this one. Take care, and I'll see you next time on The Secret History. Living in your aquarium.